song, like the Picasso one, eh, not so much. So, you know, it ultimately just does depend. Oh. Um, so again, that's kind of my uh, overall thing is, you know, it's better to kind of, you know, focus on, you know, your top 10% because at the end of the day, I'm like, kind of like talking back to that bell curve, you know, at the end of the day, your goal is to beat the person sitting next to you, you know, as ultra hyper competitive as it sounds, that's just how it is. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this test is a metric to which it's standardized and your score in the month of, if you take it in March, for example, you're compared to the other people who took it in March. So, and that's just what it is. And so from that, it's just important to note, you want to maximize your accuracy with the allotted time that you have. And that's the whole purpose of this, you know, of pacing. So whether or not, you know, and that's, you know, the, the most, you know, important thing that I've seen a lot of students, you know, have issues with is um, when they review, does anyone know, you know, kind of what the most common mistake is? Actually, two common mistakes. Does anyone know what those mistakes are? If you want to just name one, while they're, you know, while they're practicing pa practice passages or while they're, um, you know, doing that just overall, you know, just studying for the this test. Yes, yes, Dylan, that's 100% right. Hindsight bias. Um, bullshit, you would have known that because you didn't know it in your practice. I'm going to be, I straight up tell anyone that says, oh, yeah, well, you know, if I would have put more time, you know, uh, you know, I would have done this. No, you wouldn't have. You would have got it wrong on the real test, just like you got it wrong in the, you know, <laughs> on the real thing. So when you're practice passaging or, you know, reviewing, you know, hindsight bias, 100%. Be honest. Because guess what? It, it, you know, I know this might sound callous, but it really doesn't matter to me what your score is. Of course, you know, I'm here to help you, so it does matter. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's your score. It's your future. And you have to be honest because at the end of the day, the test doesn't, it won't care, you know, if you would have known it, you know, five minutes after you left, you didn't know it five minutes before. So, and that's the important thing about reviewing why you got things right. Because a lot of people skim over that. And I kind of already talked about that. So does anyone know kind of what the other, you know, main thing is? So the main thing that I also see is people, I don't know why necessarily they do it, you know, perhaps it's just, uh, um, I don't know if it's just like they want that immediate feedback, but they do things if you guys use UWorld, if you've used AMC, there's something called a tutor mode, where it essentially gives you immediate feedback. Don't do that. That's not what's going to happen on your real test. You're not going to be, oh, wow, you got this question right, you know, good job. They don't, no, you won't. You're gonna have to go through the whole test consistently thinking, did I answer that question right? And you have to be, you know, again, back to what I was saying, comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, you have to get into that mindset. So, you know, people using um, review mode or, um, you know, turning off time mode, which that is also, that's just equally as bad. Um, you know, and I, I mean, like, again, if you're initially starting out and you're just trying to pass a map, yeah, no, that's one thing, but you know, like at the end of the day, um, the test isn't going to stop its counter for you. You know, you're not going to, um, and I know, you know, of course I've had, you know, 
you know, family, you know, runs into the room or, you know, other issues arise, you know, obviously, you know, that's life. Um, and that's what, that's why it's so important to get kind of that, uh, a place where you can be in the zone, whether it's, you know, obviously with COVID very, very difficult compared to what it would be. Um, but doing practice passages at your local Starbucks, even during, you know, a non COVID non pandemic era would probably not have been smart either. Uh, because that's just not what your testing environment will be. You want to test as close as possible to what you're going to be in. And, you know, you know, kind of what I recommend, you know, in addition to that. So, you know, your testing conditions. And I know this might sound goofy, but at least when you're doing the practice test, you're going to have to wear a mask the whole time. And, you know, obviously if you have glasses, if you have, um, that, that can definitely, you know, just be kind of an irritant. Um, but, you know, a lot of people you know, kind of, you know, don't do that. They go in and then, you know, you go through, you have testing anxiety, you start to sweat, you know, you have a mask on, you know, it can just become quote unquote harder to breathe. And then it's just like, you know, you're, you know, as you kind of feel trapped essentially. At least that's what I've heard many people going through. And, you know, obviously again, you at the end of the day, you can simulate, you can simulate, you can simulate, but nothing will be like when you go in for the real test. Um, you know, you want to wear a mask, you want to take the breaks. I mean, I never took a break during my practice exams, but I sure as hell did on the real desk because it was just that much more intense and just that much more, you know, impactful. Um, so I would recommend taking the breaks uh, when you get them. Whether or not it's only, you know, five minutes of it, you know, that's fine, but really, you know, kind of emphasizing that. So, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, the main thing. So now let's talk about kind of certain types of questions and question types that you'll have on the MCAT. So the Roman numeral question, does anyone know how to approach a Roman numeral question? I guess I tried to cancel one of the numerals, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you have a particular one that you start with? So the method that I came up with, you want to focus on the number that appears twice in your answer choices. Not three times, not one time, but twice. And sometimes, yeah, you're not going to have that um, luxury, but it makes answering a question easier. So, you know, this is obviously a very easy question, but I'm just doing it for the purposes of this. So the numbers that appear twice, what we have, uh, one, 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 that's three times, two, two, okay, that's twice, three, three, that's twice. So my recommendation would be to start with two or three. Because if I went with one and I said, okay, you know, one's correct, well, then I can only get rid of one answer. Whereas if I start with two, which of course, another kind of thing in on the MCAT is opposites. So obviously these two are opposites of one another. You know, they both can't be right. It can't possibly be right. So let's just say we start with two, you know, increased osteoblast activity. Well, we know PTH is involved in releasing calcium into the bloodstream to increase serum levels. So two can't be right. So now I was able to eliminate two of them. So between A and C, which one do I, should I, uh, or what, between um, one and three, which one should I you know, look at next? Three, exactly, because one has to be right. Assuming my logic was right for two, one has to be right. It's in both answer choices. So I look at three, increased calcium in the blood. Again, we already dis uh, decided that. And again, this was an incredibly easy um, uh, you know, question. So at that point, 
you know, A is incorrect because three is also right. So therefore C is the best answer. And that's why, you know, I, you know, I use that strategy. So you focus on the number that appears twice in your answer choices, which isn't very hard to find. And then you're going to cancel the one that, you know, shows up in one, or if it shows up in both of your remaining answer choices, well, it has to be one had to have been correct, assuming our logic was correct for two. And of course, yes, if you have extra time on the test, I highly encourage you to check one because again, you never know. Um, but you know, that's kind of what you want to do to rapid fire. And that's very important for cars to uh, being able to kind of go through that elimination process. So now all of the following are irreversible ways to alter a protein except what? So what number would we start with here? Three? Exactly. One appears, one, two, three. Two appears, one, two, three. And then three appears only twice. So let's start there. Because again, if I, you know, if I looked at one and let's just say I said it was correct, well, I could only get rid of C. If I looked at three and said, okay, um, I mean, if I looked at two and said, okay, this is correct, well, then I can only get rid of A. Whereas if I look at three, if I can determine if it's correct or not, well, then I can eliminate two answers. So all of the following are irreversible ways to alter a protein except what? So what is the only irreversible way to alter a protein? Oops. Temperature, exactly. Temperature, if you, it's just like the fry an egg, um, you know, example. If I fry an egg, I can't convert it back, you know. Whereas, you know, if I change the pH, if I change, you know, if I add urea to it, for example, I can get rid of the denaturant by taking out it. Um, and, you know, whereas with the temperature, I can't reverse that. It's just far too far gone um, at that point. So we know that, you know, that is an irreversible way and of course, we're saying it's except. So, um, you know, we start with three now. So reducing disulfide bonds. Again, beta mercapta ethanol, I can remove that and I can put in an oxidizing agent. And voila, you know, that's correct. And so therefore, since I started out with three and we know that it's correct, I can get rid of A and B. So now between C and D, which number would I want to go for next? I guess between one and two, which one would I want to go for next? One, exactly. Again, two shows up here and here. Assuming our logic was right for three, it has to be correct. So there's no point in me checking two at this time. Again, if you have extra time on the test, you should obviously check it. But in terms of, you know, let's just say you have five minutes left, you're on the left, you're just now starting the last passage. This is not a bad strategy to kind of net a few extra seconds. So now let's check one. Changing the temperature, we already know that that's an irreversible way. So therefore, D is incorrect. Well, one is incorrect, which makes D incorrect. And therefore, C is the correct answer. That's the gist of the Roman numeral strategy is to approach it um, you know, kind of like that. So let's go into, uh, we kind of already talked about that. So, well, this is kind of tied in with it. So I know this is uh, crudely drawn, um, but can anyone tell me uh, oh wait, this is supposed to be labeled M. It's the same um, thing, except for uh, this is in 
a um, non-diabetic population. And this is in a uh, diabetic population. That's the only difference between the two. So can anyone tell me what's off about this? Besides the bad drawing, I know that's bad, but. Twos are different. I'm sorry. Graph. Wait, what'd you say? I'm sorry. Yeah, whenever you're looking at the graph, it's like an extra. Which? The y axis has different like scales like the top one goes up by two and the bottom one only goes up by one so it's gonna be if you just look mm -hmm. at how to see like the just the results it'll be it'll look less traumatic exactly so again what is this test or you know what is the mcat what's the whole purpose behind it you know it's to test if you can be a doctor you know so I imagine most of you, since you have been pre-meds, you guys have shadowed a doctor or two um, over your undergrad or you know beyond careers. And so how many times have you been with a doctor and then been approached by a farm rep, for example? You know, and this farm rep, you know, generally, you know, brings the whole salesman's peach, uh, pit, peach pitch, you know, he's he or she is like, you know, oh, you know, this new drug is great, you know, fantastic. Look at the data. And this is what they show you. Well, it looks great, doesn't it? But after a closer, you know, analysis, the Y graph, you know, the Y axis is, you know, set up differently. And this is what farm reps do. This is what well, pharmaceutical companies do that farm reps don't run the data generally. Um, but this is what they do. And it's not unethical. It really isn't. Um, you know, the controls are at different areas. I mean, of course, that's just the control, you know, the diabetic. But it's showing, in this case, I believe the M was mannitol. Um, but, you know, kind of looking at this, the DW, it looks way more effective than our control up here. It's about, you know, 1.4. And this is 1. But again, down here, this is only 1.6. Well, and by the time it levels back out, it's almost 1.5. So there's no difference. And that's what they like to do on the MCAT is they like to skew this data in certain ways. And, you know, because it's a test, you know, they're trying to test if you have the intuition to be able to read stuff like this, because physicians have to do this all the time. They have to be able to look at data that's provided to them and determine, okay, well, is it a good drug or is it not a good drug? And of course that just comes
Sorry, I guess my uh, Zoom just decided to crash. Um, could I have host permissions back? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, cool. So again, what are the two ways of determining significance on the MCAT? P-value. So P-value, and what what specifically? What does the value have to be? Less than 0 0.055. Exactly. So generally, P-values are based on these things called Alpha's coefficients, and essentially that's our confidence that we are indeed significant. The other way is by a graphical output. Generally, on the MCAT, they're okay with this. It's not the best in actual science, but if your error bars don't overlap, um, you can also determine significance. Um, again, they like to, generally other tests are run in addition, but the MCAT doesn't include all the tests because it doesn't want to overload you with figures. Um, and again, kind of just as a touch on, you know, the overall figure kind of mention on my test, and I might've shared this last time, I had, you know, at least on the chem phys, I know for a fact, the bio, I can't quite remember, that's a bit too murky. Um, but the chem phys, I had, you know, nine passages and each of them, every single one had two to three figures. So, you know, that's 18, 20 figures. So can you guess how many figures I actually ended up using in the questions themselves? Fourteen. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, Fourteen. Uh, actually, no, I only used them twice. I used two figures and they were both in the same passage. Now, again, you might end up encountering a test that is, you know, the exact opposite. You might have to use all 19, 18, 20 of them. So I highly recommend when going through your first read through, do not read graphs. Do not read into graphs unless they're specifically asking you about that figure. And again, they're gonna reference that figure. Um, there's no point in interpreting, you know, values that are there because there's so many, so many times where, especially in physics passages, they love to just, you know, shit out formulas basically. And they just have all of those formulas, you know, laid out and then you use maybe one of them. But, you know, three of the others didn't matter. And so that's just kind of where, again, just that time saving element comes in is being able to detect, okay, and using intuition to kind of, you know, determine, okay, should I use, you know, this figure? Should I approach this problem? Yes or no. And that's, you know, the most important part about that. Um, so we're going to go over mapping in a bit. We already went over skipping. So the extreme options. So again, as I reiterated over and over and over, this is a test of logic and reasoning. If, would it be reasonable if I were to say, you know, someone was, you know, in a physics-based thing, uh, someone was able to exert a force of, you know, 100,000 Newtons, you know, that's, that's not reasonable. It's not at all. It's just not, it's just not possible. So again, this test is based on real life, unless otherwise specified. It's based on real life. And again, they're going to be testing on topics that are related to your kind of field. So again, we've already talked about Doppler effect related to ultrasound. We've talked about um, fluids and pressure being related to blood pressure. Um, different, you know, uh, um, the, uh, what's that other topic in um, optics, obviously related to um the eyes. And so 
it's just very important to kind of understand that they're never going to throw something at you that is, you know, it's, it has to be physically possible. So you can kind of get rid of answers that just, even if the math shows it, because that's what they love to do with the math, um, is they love to show answers where if you just did one mistake wrong, if you just made one mistake, you get that answer. Um, and anytime just with math, they, anytime you're calculating and you're like halfway through the problem and you know, you, you know, you have the right formula, you know, you have everything. And one of your like intermediate steps is an answer choice, eliminate that answer choice. So, you know, intermediate steps. So, um, let me think. Um, so let's just say I had to calculate K. And let's just say I first had to calculate Delta G. Let's just say I was given, you know, Delta G is equal to Delta H minus T Delta S. Well, let's just say I was given T, uh, H, T, S, and I was able to, you know, get a value for G, Delta G. Let's just say it's 10. At that point, if there's an answer choice that states 10, most likely you can eliminate it at that point. Highly, highly unlikely that you're going to actually, you know, have an answer choice like that. Well, then we can relate, you know, delta G to negative RT, natural log of K. And of course, we could have done that with the equation, but that was just showing you kind of that example. Um, because overall, again, you just want to eliminate things as you go along back to the, you know, just elimination as an uh, overarching concept for all the testing strategies is to, you know, reduce the likelihood that you'll get the answer wrong. That's ultimately what it comes down to, because, you know, I'm just going to be, you know, straight up honest with you. When you go into the test, you're not going to know everything. No one does. Um, very, very few people that, you know, do, um, you know, if anyone, you know, claims that they do, you know, they went in knowing everything and they, you know, everything they saw, uh, they had seen before, like a hundred percent, you know, they're lying. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just the truth. It's just not, you know, possible in that sense. And so again, kind of with that, you know, you just want to be able to kind of uh, tie in, you know, those real life things, because again, examples like 10,000 or 100,000 newtons of force or, you know, uh, saints, uh, trying to think, um, another way, but, um, you know, those are very, you know, kind of, uh, or like, oh, um, the other one is this. So refractive index. Does anyone know that formula off the top of their head? not based on Snell's law, but based on, so the formula is N is equal to C over V. Well, let's just say you were, you know, had to provide that formula. That was like one of the questions. Well, it physically can't be possible for it to be V over C because the speed of light is unmatched. You know, C is the speed of light. We already know, because again, what's the refractive index of air of a vacuum? Speed greater than, exactly, you can't have a speed greater than the speed of, there's no such thing. Um, and so, you know, the refractive index of air is one, or the vacuum is one, however you want to, you know, lay it out. So in order for our velocity, in order for this side of the equation to equal one, our, um, our, uh, um, our uh, frequency, or, well, our velocity would have to you know, be equivalent to that. And it's just not possible. Um, and so that's just kind of, you know, those things where you can eliminate those kind of just bizarre answer choices. And again, they're not looking for um, the exception. They're, you know, they're looking for, you know, likely to pop up. And that kind of goes into the next um, thing that we're talking about. What do you think I mean when I say a zebra versus a horse?
common versus uncommon. So if a patient is in, let's just, you know, spin a tail real fast, you're a physician, a patient comes in, they have a cough, are you going to immediately assume they have the, you know, most ultra rare condition that occurs one in 100 million people? Are you going to automatically assume that they have, you know, a lung cancer or a nodule on their lung? If you do, then you're a bad physician. Um, because again, that's not, that's, it's not common. You can't apply a unique situation to every single case. Again, the MCAT is testing you on becoming a physician. And while there are bizarre cases, while there are medical anomalies, of course, not saying those don't occur. However, every single patient that comes in you know, to your future clinic will not have cancer or unless you're an oncologist, of course, but you know, will not you know, assuming you're running, you know, a family practice, they're not going to come in and have some rare autosomal recessive that occurs one in 20 million people. It's just not likely. And so that's what the MCAT loves to do is they love to throw those extreme options at you. Um, they love to throw those, you know, different, um, they love to throw those different answers at you. So the zebra is mentioning kind of the rare, obviously instance, and the horse is, you know, just, you know, you're common. And you want to be familiar with the common, you know, things. Because again, at the end of the day, you're not going to see the exceptions every single time. So for example, what are the three things that can bind to hydrogen and, you know, essentially enact hydrogen bonding? Or what are the three, I guess, elements or atoms? Yeah, FON. Did you know that sulfur can also hydrogen bond? In a particular instance um, within the body, uh, cysteine can undergo hydrogen bonding. But guess what? Do you think the MCAT is going to test that? No. Because, again, the test is meant to focus on what's, what's the most common thing. So, you know, obviously, FON, chemistry is fun. Hydrogen bonding is fun. Um, are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, looking at this test, you know, we want to focus on, you know, what's common, what's not focusing on the exception to the rule. Um, let me think of another one. Um, um, you know, they're going to throw things at you that, you know, you're, you would either see, and again, they'll, they're going to hint at if it is kind of an odd one. So I have seen passages before on case studies, you know, at that point, perhaps this rule can kind of be shifted a little bit. Um, but like, again, they're not going to ask you for these bizarre, wacky scenarios where it's like, you know, you were, you're going to see something that you would not have, you know, been prepared for or studied for. And it's all, you know, this is getting at is that don't, and if this is, you know, this is true in, um, you know, in car and especially in cars where making inferences outside of the reasoning and bringing outside knowledge, like, you know, quite frankly, you know, I don't really care, um, how much, uh, you know, re um, four, 45. 40? Um, 40, 45, 40. So 45, 40. So you're getting that based off of um, which which of these? Um, the Michaelis Mitten or the Lion Weaver Bird? Um, the Michaelis Mitten. So the issue with that is, and this is, you know, what I, you know, I, I really like this passage um, overall because it's really solid. Um, this can theoretically keep going. We don't really know where it goes or when it, you know, caps off. We see that it's starting to level off, but it can theoretically increase more. So we don't necessarily know. That's the danger of using a Michaelis mitten when trying to determine our um, V max. Whereas here, what's the Y intercept of a line of Burke plot? One over V max. One over V max. So if I look at that, 0 0.02, you know, then what I would do is I would just take, um, put that over there. 
So one over V is equal to, you know, 0 0.02, one over V is equal to two times 10 to the negative two. Um, switch that one over two times 10 to the negative two is equal to V. And then I would just move it to the top. So 0 0.5 times 10 to the second, move that over one, five times 10 to the first, 50. So out of all these answer choices, again, 0 0.02, that's exactly what's here. So we know that's wrong because that's just one over V max. 23 doesn't even make sense based on either graph. I mean, it's already up to 40. So we know it can't be either one of those. Um, Oops. 45 ish. So that was weird. Cool. All right. Um, so again, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was going back. So one over V, um, I should the math over here. So two times 10 and then I guess second, moved it over, you know, then I divided my values out, moved my uh, scientific notation at the top, which took off the negative, then I divided it, or then I moved over, moved it over two, which gave me 50, around 50, um, which 52 is our closest answer. And again, that's the best estimate. You know, that's what it's asking for. And again, that's a, a lot of what the MCAT is based on is, you know, what's the best answer? Not what's the right answer. What's the best answer? And so again, we could eliminate 23 because based on either graph, you know, it's way, it's well above 40 or it's going to 40. Um, or it's, well, it's past 40 at that point. And again, that's how they were trying to trick you was they were saying, ah, well, your VMAX is, you know, at this point right here. Well, again, our graph can continuously go, go, go. And while it does seem to level off, again, the hyperbolic curves tend to continuously increase for a very, very long time, even though they look like they're leveled off. And so that's the danger of using that. Um, now, if they had drawn, for like, you know, um, if they had drawn, like, a line like this, um, and they said this was Vmax, then perhaps that would have been more appropriate. However, again, since we get this line we have a Burke plot, we should use that to determine our um, Vmax at the most accurate level. So that would make C wrong. Oops. That would make C wrong, and therefore D is the correct answer for the first one. So, now, two, which of the following represent possible sources of error when estimating KM and Vmax from a line weaver Burke plot? So, again, using the Roman numeral strategy, which one would we want to start with? So we wouldn't want to start with three because if we eliminated three, oops, if we eliminated three, then then we're still left with three answer choices. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't necessarily matter in this case because of the way it's set up. There's three one choices, three two choices, and then one three. And so at this point, yeah, we can just go down through each one and each individual part and then um, go from there. So, you know, we'll just start with one. The inability to obtain negative values of one over S often extra or often requires extrapolation of the linear fit over a stretch lacking data points in order to determine the X intercept. So again, our one over S, is it possible to have a substrate concentration that's negative? No. Exactly. It's impossible. And thus, that's why the Lang weaver burke plot is kind of imaginary in a sense, because it's extrapolating data. You know, over here is this intercept. And essentially, we have to extrapolate to that point. And that's exactly what they're saying. They're just making it very convoluted. Often requires extrapolation of the linear fit over a long stretch, lacking data points in order to determine the x-intercept. So again, there are no data points here. Whereas there are a ton throughout our positive region, of course, because we can't measure that, but we can't measure it here. 
And that's the error with the Lion Weaver Burke plot is that you can't measure any substrate concentration. So if a question were to ever ask you, you know, or to ever plot data points over here, it's wrong. It's not possible to have a negative substrate concentration. You can't. It's just not not feasible. And so, you know, that is an issue with it, you know, because that's obviously our answer or our question is asking for possible sources of error. So one easily fits this. So we can eliminate this one. Now, this is the case where um, we would want to go for, um, doesn't necessarily matter. We can just go um, through two to three or you know, any of them. So we'll just start with two errors in the data obtained at low substrate concentrations have a disproportionate impact on the determination of the best linear fit. So what that essentially is stating. So at low substrate concentration, you know, we have, you know, one over S and essentially it's saying that that kind of determines the linear fit. And we can kind of see that because um, whenever you start Michaelis Mitten, you start it out at a lower saturation and then you saturate your enzyme essentially with um, more substrate. And so it starts out with a lot of data points and then they slowly space out more and more and more. However, it's these guys, oops, um, it's um, these guys here, well, not the negative ones, but um, these guys here that kind of determine everything. As, as to where, what the linear fit is, what that y equals mx plus b will be. So that's ultimately the another error that occurs is that, you know, that low substrate concentration kind of affects that. So visual estimation of KMV max is more challenging from a linear plot as compared to the hyperbolic plot of v versus s. So... Again, we already kind of talked about this with the previous example, but it's easier to determine that. And that's exactly what the passage stated was that, you know, um, it was difficult fit to, you know, obtain this data. So therefore to overcome this problem, we use the line weaver bird. And that's, you know, three is saying the op is saying the opposite of what the passage, you know, stated. And so therefore that's not a complication. That's actually one of the, the strengths of the line we were plot. So three is wrong and therefore C is correct. So that's kind of uh, that question. Um, so which of the following is true concerning the slope of a line we were plot in the presence of a competitive versus non-competitive inhibitor. So let's just quickly go over here. Uh, All right, so competitive, how does that affect the KN? Increase? Yep, non-competitive. If unchanged? Unchanged. And then uncompetitive. Decrease? Decrease. Yep. V max for competitive? Unchanged. Non competitive? Decrease. Mm hmm. And then uncompetitive? Decrease. Yep. And then. Where does the competitive inhibitor bind? And then non-competitive and uncompetitive. Competitive and uncompetitive will be to the allosteric site. Whereas competitive. Well, competitive is. Oh. 
Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. So, okay, I thought you were saying competitive. Yeah, yeah. So competitive is active site. Um, non-competitive is Alistair. And uncompetitive can be Alistair or it's enzyme sub complex is also another way. Um, that it's ultimately, which is why the KM is reduced and our binding affinity thus is increased. You know, that's the whole uh, reason why um, it decreases in that. And the way to kind of remember this um, is competitive. You can spell it competitive. It has KM, so therefore it increases. Non-competitive has no KM change. All you have to remember for that one is that it has a Vmax decrease and uncompetitive. If I flip my first letter upside down and put arrows on it, both show a decrease. And that's labeled here and here. So that's just kind of a, a quick way to remember that's kind of the confusing, confusing aspect. Of course, it's important to know why exactly a KM decreases or why exactly a VMAX decreases. So now we can approach this question over here. Which of the following is true concerning the slope of a line weaver Berg plot in the presence of a competitive versus a non-competitive inhibitor. So let's just go through it. So the slope changes in the presence of both a competitive and non-competitive inhibitor. Okay. Well, what exactly is the slope of a line weaver Berg plot without going back up there? So the slope of a line weaver Burke plot is KM over V max as based on that. So KM over V max. Well, the slope changes in the presence of both the competitive and non-competitive inhibitor. Well, of course it will. KM changes in our competitive, V max changes in our non. So that's already the answer, but we'll go through the other ones as to why they're wrong. The slope changes in the presence of competitive inhibitor only. No, again, the VMAX changes in non. Slope changes in the presence of non. Nope. And the slope does not change in the presence of either. You know, relatively straightforward one that can be found based on that. And that was only, you know, knowing the, you know, different relationships and taking the slope into account. So reductive detoxification of re uh, reactive oxygen intermediates is critical to the survival of aerobic organisms. Which of the following is uh, most directly involved in this process in humans? So this is a, there are kind of two ways to classify this question. It's discrete, meaning I don't really need the passage for it. And then the other one is called a two by two, where essentially the first half is the same in ADH, in ADH, but then the second half changes, pentose phosphate gluconeogenesis. So um, and then in the other ones, NADPH, NADPH, and then just switch around the ending, pentose phosphate, gluconeogenesis. So between NADH and NADPH, uh, um, which one is involved in uh, reductive detoxification? NADPH? NADPH. Yep, NADPH. Correct. So, and I'm just going to kind of uh, lay out the differences real fast because this is sometimes a confusing thing. NADH versus our NADPH. Let's just kind of brainstorm really quickly. What What is NADPH involved in and what is NADH involved in? Just, you know, start naming them off in the chat what each of these processes are critical in. You know. Well, I meant like more metabolic wise, but I mean, that's a you know, good thing to know as well. So NADH, what's the big 
I mean, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of them. Uh, NADH electron carriers, exactly. Also, what before the electron transport chain? Yeah, exactly. Pentose phosphate pathway. So I'll write that. Okay. All right, so NADH uh, or NADPH, we said it was part of the pentose phosphate pathway. Any other guesses as to what it's involved in? There's another huge process that you guys have to know about. Part of the reductive phase of this cycle, or not cycle, um, of this process. So fatty acid synthesis is what NADPH is also used in. So. So now let's brainstorm what NADH is used as a part of. So NADH. What is NAD? I mean, we already said the electron carriers. That's it. Yeah, I mean, that's more um, used in that regard. But, um, you know, what else is this kind of related to? Microboxylic acid cycle, the big one, glycolysis. I use NADH and I generate it from this, you know, you know, different things like glycolysis and the whole process of breaking down that glucose, like you guys have said, you know, the electron transport chain, and then you know, obviously TCA. Exactly. So what kind of relating, you know, kind of looking at these side by side, also beta oxidation. So looking at both of these, what else does the pentose phosphate pathway do? There's two things that it can do. There's two phases, oxidative and non-oxidative. So what is the, um, well, I guess, what do the different phases do? So that's the non-oxidative or the oxidative? So that would actually be the non-oxidative because the non-oxidative is reversible. And essentially I can form all the glycolytic intermediates um, through that um, through that kind of component. Um, so I can throw in like xylose, so I can in like all these different carbohydrate intermediates, which can then go back to fructose phosphate or G6P phosphate. So that's the non-oxidative. Of course, there is, you know, one component of oxidative that can technically enter into a glycolytic intermediate, but non-oxidative is more involved with that. So the oxidative phase is used in our, um, the development of nucleotides, nucleotide synthesis. Ribulose 5-phosphate is where the oxidative phase comes into play, which goes into ribulose 5-phosphate, which then generates our nucleotides. So um, so looking at these as an overview, what's kind of, you know, What's kind of the stark contrast between the two? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I forgot. I, I I forgot if it's this one of Adobe Acrobat. Where I have to combine files. Ugh, I don't know if I have it. I have to combine the uh, files. A Sona, my Sona, your mic on. Just by the way. Um, so what's kind of the, you know, main similarity between our, um, our, um, you know, looking at NADH, or I guess a stark contrast between NADH and NADPH. Looking at those different processes.
Exactly. Yeah, Dylan, you nailed it right on the head. NAD, NADH, all of those processes, glycolysis, TCA, electron transport chain, OxFOS, that's all literally the conversion of glucose into individual oxygen molecules. That's it. It's the oxidation of each individual carbon. That's it. And what that means is it's breaking down things. NADH is used in catabolic processes, whereas NADPH is anabolic, building things up, fatty acid synthesis, nucleotide synthesis, et cetera. And so beta oxidation is kind of the main and obviously the other contrast. So again, our NADPH is more um, anabolic in nature, meaning it builds things up, and NADH is catabolic. It's more involved in the catabolic processes. Now, this isn't to say that that's mutually exclusive, but for the purposes of the MCAT, it is. So the main other things of NADPH, other functionalities, it's involved in glutathione synthesis, which is involved in detoxification of free radicals. Oh, I forgot to also mention NADPH. It's fatty acid synthesis. Since something else is related relatively close to um, a fatty acid as it's a part of uh, the family of lipids, cholesterol synthesis. So again, it's involved in all these synthetic uh, processes, whereas NADH is in the, involved in breaking things down. So that's just kind of uh, the main thing. So now we can use the two by two discrete method. Well, we already know that NADPH is the only one of those two, you know, uh, detox free radicals. So A and B are gone. So now it's just to determine, well, where does it fit? And of course we know NADPH is primarily produced in, it's basically only produced in the pentose phosphate pathway. And that's how you get that answer. And so again, Obviously, that wouldn't you know, have taken you guys that long. However, I did want to have kind of that sidetrack to talk about the differences between NADPH and NADH because that's a, um, a topic I've seen more practice sessions going into, um, at least uh, like, uh, like through what the Princeton's been doing recently is more focusing on those intermediates and the cofactors and kind of breaking those down um, because apparently they've been, there's been a more push to add more biochem onto the exam which makes sense. Biochem obviously relates quite heavily to the field of medicine. And so, you know, they've been incorporating more things like this into their uh, lectures. And so I think it's important to kind of touch on as to, well, what is really the difference between NADPH and NADH? Obviously you can memorize a note card and know that NADPH is from the pentose phosphate pathway, but what does that mean? And that's the important thing of, you know, this. So now let's move on to question five. All the following are true concerning inhibitor A, except, so now we gotta go up to inhibitor A. Yeah, and this is a weird passage. Um, I don't think they have an actual inhibitor A labeled. I think it's, um, I wanna say it's, um, all the following are true. Yeah, that's a weird, it's it's a weird printout. Um, essentially, they messed up the thing. The answer to this one, I believe, is, if our memory serves me correctly, it's B, it's enzyme, um, its effect on enzyme activity is equivalent to that of decreasing the concentration of the uninhibited enzyme. And that ultimately just states that it's a um, competitive in nature. Um, again, because competitive is one of the few where if I add more substrate, then I can overcome the competitive inhibitor. Because, you know, again, competitive inhibitors are binding at the active site, which means that um, if I add more active sites to my solution or my uh, experiment, my enzyme has a higher likelihood of being able to bind to it. And that's all I'm saying. So now we can look at which of the following represents the lion lever burr plot of an enzyme solid line and in the presence of a non-competitive inhibitor, what we've already talked about, non-competitive inhibitor are um, 
our Vmax decreases, but our KM remains the same. So we can take that into account. Um, so now let's just determine, um, you know, so since our KM doesn't change, our X intercept will not change. So looking at those, the only one that makes sense is A. You know, I mean, uh, B would be um, a um, competitive inhibitor. Um, uh, C would be an uncompetitive. It has the parallel aspect, and D doesn't make any sense again because there's no. It's not intersecting at a particular point, um, and that's just kind of uh, those differences. So again, out of this passage, we used this figure. I mean, I guess we would have, we technically would have used either one of these, but again, it's kind of, it's not the best um, overall. So we would have used, you know, two figures. And I mean, technically, um, if, you, uh, if you do know the equation off the top of your head, you shouldn't have needed to reference those. I mean, we definitely didn't need, you need to use equation one. Equation two, we technically looked at for the slope just to like have a refresher. But again, um, you could have also gotten the slope from just this part too. Um, and so again, that just kind of goes to show that, you know, there'll be certain points where figures, where equations aren't necessary, they're just extra words. And there's no need to, you know, review them because again, we don't necessarily know how that will be um, impacted. So kind of if I was going through this, you know, thing, I've, I've, I've done this passage like, like one other time before this. And so I kind of remembered certain aspects. Again, if I was um, some kind of common things that you could have seen if you didn't know what NADPH's function is, since the passage was talking about NADH, you might that could have been what's called an attractor. And so you might have been you know attracted to that answer because NADH was mentioned. That's what's most recent in your brain, and you would have gone with it. And so that's a common mistake I've seen people make. Um, so, um, again, if you know this kind of setup over here, this passage is incredibly straightforward. Like two of our questions relied on that essentially, um, which was very nice. And there'll be passages like that on the MCAT where it'll rely on just literally one or one table of relationships, whether it's the um, optics and the lights with the mirrors and lenses, or if it's um, you know, the enzymes. Um, and so, you know, again, there are certain things that like, obviously, you know, tripped you guys up. It looked like the Lion Weaver Burke plot versus McKaylee's Mitten. So kind of, um, you know, just as a you know, disclaimer to that, a McKaylee's Mitten, again, is more based on determining cooperativity. So McKaylee's Mitten is more for cooperativity purposes. Lion Weaver Burke plot is for more inhibition purposes or determining if there are inhibitors. Um, I mean, again, obviously, Lion Weaver Burke plot is more accurate, but it's not the most accurate thing out there, um, as obviously the passage was referring to over and over again. And so, again, McKaylee's men, Lion Weaver uh, would be mainly cooperativity, you know, sigmoidal relating to a cooperative binding, and hyperbolic relating to a. Um, no cooperativity present. Um, and then, um, you know, again, we discussed the NADH, NADPH. Those um, graphs are pretty simple. I wouldn't recommend memorizing the graphs like any of them. Um, just know the relationships. So this table over here. And that's, you know, then you can determine everything else from that. Um, but yeah, again, like that's kind of how I would approach a passage. I probably would have used my um, um, my actual mapping more so throughout it. Um, however, again, um, this passage, you know, one question, two. So we use so this one, this one. So literally half of our passage was discrete knowledge. We didn't have to reference the passage at all. You know, question three, didn't need to. Question four, I mean, it didn't, I mean, in referencing the passage would have actually hurt us if we would have thought NADH and have gone with that. And then passage, and then number six, not at all either. Um, so again, that just goes to show that sometimes 
passages won't always be every single question is related to it. Sometimes it'll just be a random, like this one's really a random discrete one, number four. Um, and I those those popped up on my tests. I mean, and that's just the, you know, the truth. Like sometimes they'll be random questions that'll just, you know, they'll relate to the topic, but they won't be part of that passage or ask a specific question or test on the methodology of that passage. So that's kind of, um, you know, mainly it when it comes to testing strategies. Um, probably the most important one I can, uh, again, state is the just, you know, logic and reasoning at the end of the day. Uh, this test, they're not trying to test you on the zebra, they're testing you on the horse. Um, they don't, I mean, they're going to be tricky, but they're not like going out of their way to trick you. Um, because they know at the end of the day, they're trying to build a test that accurately predicts whether or not you can use intuition within the sciences to determine if things are correct or incorrect, given limited information. Because, um, you know, um, if you have a patient, are you always going to have all the information you need on them? No. You know, sometimes you're going to have to make decisions without all the information present. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're testing you on all those different things. They're testing you on not giving you all the information, giving you too much information, giving you um, skewed information, changing graphs around. Because again, it's not unethical. It's not good, but it's not, it's not unethical to do that. Um, and so, you know, it's it, at the end of this day, at the end of the day, this test requires, you know, the logic, the reasoning behind each of those sections. Um, and I don't think we have necessarily enough time to go through a car's passage at this time. But um, it's, I mean, the passage mapping is essentially the same thing. The only thing I change is, you know, I have my P1, P2, P3, P4. Then I write, you know, author. And I write, you know, whether or not they had a positive, a negative, an apathetic kind of view towards the subject. So I would write positive on, and if there was like an argument, I would write on the argument. And then I would write, you know, negative on the other side of the argument. Um, then I would write M, which was the main point. Um, so again, if the if point was to inform, give an opinion, criticize, whatever. You know, that way, because again, a lot of this a lot of the times those passages are based on reading into what the author was saying um, and being able to determine that is obviously half the battle in reading a car section. But essentially, that's the same thing um, overall. So does anyone have any questions at this present time? with regards to testing strategies, approaching the MCAT or anything else related to the test. Best stress relief while studying. That is, I, uh, I love to swim. So that was my stress relief. Um, um, I, I definitely think having a healthy exercise regimen is important. Um, a healthy eating style. Don't get into junk food. Don't get into excess caffeine um, because your body won't thank you. you know, your mind won't thank you. Um, you know, do this. You know, you want to just kind of maintain as normal of a routine as possible um, throughout this. And that's just the most important thing um, overall is to just maintain a consistent thing, um, really making a schedule. And again, I recommend kind of setting up my schedule. I'll just really quickly touch on this because I, I think scheduling is, you know, um, I think, I think Nicole, you said at the beginning, very, you know, disorganized. I was very disorganized. It's not, you know, when setting up the test, um, and like towards, you know, the middle of my study period, I kind of sat down and, you know, I thought, okay, let me make out a list of what I need to focus on personally. I'm not going to worry about what Kaplan tells me to do. I'm not going to worry what Prince tells me what I'm going to do. I'm not going to worry about the random person on Reddit, what they tell me to do. I'm going to focus on me. So, you know, that looks different for everyone. So I recommend going through the different topics on the MCAT. 
and writing out, you know, out of all of these different things. So, you know, DNA replication, I guess I should say. So what I would write out for each of these is a yield. And then a difficulty. So for example, enzymes, they're gonna pop up on your test 100%. I would rank it, you know, let's just say all of these are on a scale of one to five, for example, then you can do it on a scale of one to 10, one to 20, doesn't really matter. So one to five. Difficulty for me personally, I love enzyme kinetics. It's a great, it's one of my favorite topics in biochemistry. That would be on a scale of one to five, a two for me. Momentum in physics, the yield is like a one. I don't even think momentum is even on the exam anymore, technically. Um, I know that they do have, they do technically say it's on it, but it, it really isn't. But the difficulty for me is a five, easily. Um, replication, DNA replication, that's easily a three to a four, give or take. Um, put it as a four. Difficulty for me, and probably like, you know, a three. There's just a lot of enzymes to know, a lot of stuff to memorize. It can get confusing if you, difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, you know, throwing all that in there. So then what I would do is, you know, order these in descending order. So 52 for my enzymes, 43 for my DNA replication, and then 15 for my momentum. So even though momentum is my hardest subject out of all of these, the odds of momentum showing up is probably 2 to 5%. The odds of enzymes showing up, 100%. So that kind of helps you to kind of organize, okay, well, what's important to study? What's actually high yield? Endocrine system, high yield. Nervous system, high yield. Action potentials, high yield. You know, um, DNA you know, transcription re replication, lesser yield than those, but, you know, still higher yield than momentum. You know, and of course, there are topics in physics that are very high yield, optics, um, the gas phases, and, uh, um, but like kinematics, Newtonian physics, less and less and less. And that's like just kind of what I would recommend in terms of organizing yourself in terms of the schedule. Um, it's focusing on what's in your top 10% because your top 10% differs from mine. It differs from everyone's because certain people have strengths and other people have weaknesses. And that's just what this test ultimately comes down to is being able to focus on your weaknesses. I said it in the last um, lesson. But I easily spent 40% of, I don't know, God, how, how many hours I spent studying for the MCAT. But I spent 40% of it easily studying physics because that's my weakness. And I needed to improve there. Um, and, of course, I touched on all the other subjects that were you know, higher yield beforehand. But, like, I had a firm grasp, so I was able to go through them really fast. So that's kind of, um, you know, my recommendation when kind of approaching it and perhaps trying to find a way to organize yourself and hopefully that would you know help overall especially since you guys have three or four months before your test it wouldn't hurt you guys to set that up and just you know going through those passages making sure okay i have my list of what's difficult for me see if that changes as the weeks progress um do anything um hormones of it Yes. So like if you're breaking down the phases like follicular or luteal, not necessarily that terminology. Um, or like if you're talking about like well if you're talking about like um like talking about the like the different gonads, like the ovaries versus the um you know the testes, abs absolutely not. That's not high yield. The flick uh menstrual cycle, yeah, one hundred percent that's high yield. Um especially those hormones, FSH, L H. The phase, yeah, no, no, like primary, uh, secondary spermatocyte, those are not, those are not, diff uh, those are not, not, not difficult. They're not, um, I, I would not consider that high yield. And again, that just comes down to eliminating choices that can't possibly be right from that. Yeah, reproductive system on that scaling would be like a two to a three, but the menstrual cycle is a five. It like always pops up from what I've heard. And, you know, I can't technically say if it did or did not, but, you know. Um, yeah, the men's, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, the menstrual menstrual cycle and spe- specifically the hormones, I should say, of the menstrual the menstrual cycle itself, like again, those phases, not really. Um, but again, hormones are hormones and enzymes are like the in amino acids, of course, are the biggest topics on this. Um, you know, those are like the ones that you have to have purely memorized going into them. Um yeah, immune system is, um, is that lame? Um, it, I mean, it just depends what part of the immune system, because it's like, if you're knowing like all the different, you know, the, uh, innate immune system, you're talking about the adaptive, then you're talking about knowing the different types of, you know, uh, blood types as a part of it, knowing the different RH, you know, uh, factors. Yeah. That stuff's very, very low yield overall. I've, I, uh, um, Macrophage versus um, not really. No, um, they're more gonna ask about uh, I've I've personally seen more questions ask about um major histocompatibility complexes, um at least in my uh, I can't not again I can't say about my personal test, but um in practice stuff it's definitely more MHC stuff rather than pure and again because the test that they're not gonna throw um that kind of stuff at you. Because, you know, um, it just doesn't, again, because they want to test if you can use logic and reasoning. They don't really, I mean, like anyone can memorize anything, you know, then that just means anyone can become a doctor. And that's not, you know, obviously what they're trying to do. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in like a, a negative way. Anyone can become a doctor, but you, if you just grab a random guy on the thing, on the street, say, yeah, memorize all the different cells in the immune system, you're a doctor now. Well, that's not good you know um but yeah no um immune systems cardiovascular and nervous system are the highest yield respiratory i don't think i've ever seen a problem on a practice passage from like anywhere as far as i can recall thank god respiratory was my weakness personally um yeah yeah i really like um and I know, like, I, I definitely get a lot of, like, organic chemistry. Love, love, love that subject. Um, I wish there was more on the MCAT, but alas. It's more physics than orgo. But, you know, what are you going to do? So, yeah, I mean, are there any other uh, questions about the test, about, you know, certain topics, about, you know, how to approach certain things? Yeah, that's um, I, I was technically part of a Princeton course. I didn't I didn't really attend any of the classes. Um, I took their materials and I just used it on my own. Um, that's what they did too. Um, a lot of their orgo content was towards the end. Um, I think that's just so you can kind of cram memorize it, just so that way it's not like, you know, you memorize it at the very beginning, um, you know, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, overall, orgo is not high yield. The in the topics that are organic are tech, like again, I think I talked about it last time, but like activation energy is a topic in organic, but it's also a topic in biochemistry. It's also a topic in gen chem. Ox- redox reactions, it's a topic in orgo. It's a topic in gen chem. It's a topic in biochem. You know, so it's like there's so much overlap that like I've never seen a synthesis problem from organic chemistry pop up on any exam. Um, and if they if there would be, it would not be long by any measure. Um, and again, I don't necessarily know why, but um, yeah, I think most people find that pre meds find uh, physics ultimately more difficult. That's kind of what I've seen, um, like doing surveys and whatnot. More people find physics more difficult in the long haul. Um, and I don't know if that's just necessarily studying for the MCAT physics or if it's just physics in general, but. That's what people find difficult is physics at the end of the day, um, which I agree. Um, so, like, what do you mean? Yeah, phys- Yeah, no, physics, the, the most important thing, like, the most important thing to note is relationships. 
Um, so I'll show you real fast. Um, relationships to like, I mean, like, yeah, knowing the equations, you know, that's not, like also great, but sometimes you have to be able to build your own. So, you know, F equals MA. Well, I know that um, M is our mass, so that's in kilograms. I know that my acceleration is meters per second or squared. So that means I know that that has to equal my newtons. Well, um, the, um, the equation for um, work is, you know, force times the distance. So work has to be equivalent to my newtons times my distance, so m. And so therefore work has to be equivalent to kilogram meters squared over second squared. Well, that's my work. If I were to, um, you know, pursue that, um, you know, and again, I can change that. Um, that's ends up being joules. Well, I can end up, uh, you know, going again with power and then, you know, so on and so forth. And so I find that very easy compared to, um, looking at uh, formulas per se and memorizing all those, especially with like Ohm's laws, like, um, oh geez, the um, electric field laws. So like, um, I can't even remember them off the top of my head. There's like phi, um, FIFO something. Um, but yeah, there's like electric field, electric, uh, um, analyzing the power. I prefer to study the you know kind of those conversions uh between the different ones because again like not everyone knows what the equation for flow rate is but i know that like based on a passage i can kind of generate my equation so flow rate is ultimately f is equal to av my a is my area so my area would be you know meters squared times my v which would essentially be um um my uh, velocity so multiplied by meters over seconds, you know, meters cubed over seconds, you know, volume over seconds, essentially. And so just kind of being able to relate those different uh, relationships and those different um, patterns is e at least easier in my head. Um, and it helps me actually like, because then I can change those equations for whatever I want. I mean, I don't need to memorize um, everything. Of course, there are ones you'll have to memorize, but you don't need to like, and there are some that are such like low yield that like, like the kinematics, the big five, I don't like, I would, I don't think I remember, I didn't memorize those for the test. Um, because, you know, like what question, you got to think like, what questions can they ask me on this? Because that's ultimately how you approach this test is you have to, you know, prepare yourself for those eventualities of can they even pop up? And I didn't think kinematics could. I mean, it can, don't get me wrong, but like, they're really trying to push for it to be more related to medicine and science integrated. Um, and so they're not going to throw like, oh, like shooting a basketball in the OR, like, I don't know, maybe, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, there are certain things that can apply, but they, again, kinematics is such a low thing. If it popped up on my test, I would have just done a hell, like a Hail Mary and then, you know, had gone for something. And I would have just used logic and reasoning at that point rather than spending hours of my time doing kinematics from what I could have spent hours of time doing every other subject on the MCAT. That's way higher yield than that. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh God. <laughs> oh, Dylan, you make me want to cry. <laughs> Wait, did you see the, uh, my for you page? Oh God. We're like in a car, I think. And it was like with your, I think your company or something like your tutoring app that you talked about last week. Yeah. <laughs> King of the curve. Yeah. I saw it. And I was like, my boy, he's falling right away. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, wait, did you see my <laughs> account or did you see the actual company account? 
Oh, I saw the company one. I gotta find yours. Hold on, I'll try. <laughs> oh God. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, there was like we had like a really solid video. It was like the sodium potassium pump, um, and we used the most attractive member of our team, um, of course, to <laughs> do the TikTok videos. Obviously, that makes sense. And it got like <laughs> six hundred thousand views or something. It was insane. People love the sodium potassium pump, apparently. I don't, but I mean, it's fine. <laughs> but like, I like literally, it was a couple of days after last session. And I was like, whoa, that's heat. And I didn't <laughs> know what you looked like. So like, it took me a minute to recognize like where the voice was from. But mm -hmm. then I realized your company and everything or your app. And I was like, that is de definitely, oh my God. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, uh, it's yeah hello it's been uh it's been insane these past two weeks we've gained like six thousand followers um it's nice. been it's been incredible um i was not expecting it um yeah no, i'm yeah, sure that's the, good like mm -hmm. that's good like cash flow and stuff and bringing a tra like attention to what you're doing no, no absolutely um we have really nice updates coming out um that like you know we're trying to make it as a as inclusive as a study app as possible um yeah i know uh but um it's gonna be uh i don't know if i'm necessarily allowed to talk about it during these tutoring sessions i guess since the time is up i guess i could um but uh i don't necessarily know um but yeah uh tiktok is a is a, is is a fun fun thing let me uh let me just take a I will, uh, let me just take a screenshot of this. This is essentially our, not our next update, but it's soon, uh, to be. Go back. So essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be converting our app into a trivia uh, crack kind of thing. If you remember playing that game back in the day, um, essentially people will be able to like, you know, kind of spin the wheel and be able to compete against one another, just like trivia crack, but rather than having science, rather than having, I don't know, history, geography or whatever, it's biochemistry, gen chem, orgo, biology, physics, and the behavioral sciences. Um, so that's kind of what we're, pushing our app towards overall is uh trying to make more like that so that's awesome it's gonna be that's fun gonna be so cool awesome all right well thank you so much. absolutely um have a good one and i think if no one else has questions we'll uh be done